All right. I started by breaking down the white oak plywood for the upper case with my track saw and this nifty parallel guide system from Woodpeckers. By no means are these guides a necessity, but they definitely speed up the process of ripping consistent widths without re-measuring every time. The track saw, on the other hand, I've had almost 14 years and is one of those must-have tools in my opinion, especially if you work with sheet goods or slabs with any regularity. Now, I measure out all my case pieces and cross-cut them to width with the track saw and track square. The smaller 6 inch pieces were a little dicey with the track saw, so I went over to the table saw. Ooh, and look at that J-Cat's Moses Zero Deflection Stop Block. Mmm. There's a link in the description below if you're interested in picking one up. And I ripped those 6 inch pieces to width, no problem, on the table saw. Okay, technically they're cross cuts. Now for the miter joints that will create the waterfall look around the case, I used a 45 degree chamfering bit. You can also do this with the track saw or table saw, etc. But this router bit gives me dead on angles every time. Now to make sure I don't damage the crisp edge that will be created at the tip of the miter, the router fence needs to be slightly forward of the router bit. And the other key variable in the process is your material must be flat on the table. Hold down wheels or a featherboard are a must to make sure of this. Now I used a sacrificial board on top which will be the driver against the fence. I make a couple of test passes, adjusting the bit height each time until it creates that perfectly crisp miter. And then I lock her down. And here's a full pass in one fell swoop. Nice. Now the other option is to use double-sided tape to affix your top block to your workpiece. Uh, this ensures nothing moves. I just found it to be a little time-consuming, taking it off, putting it on, peeling it off, peeling it on, peeling it off. When I'm all done, I lay all the pieces out tip to tip and then label all the parts just in case they get stolen. Now pushing all the pieces up against a straight edge ensures they are perfectly aligned and then I can start taping the joints. I use clear packing tape so I can see the joints once I miter fold the case together and to check if there are any gaps. This is Staples brand clear packing tape. I generously, probably over generously apply glue on all the joints and then I can miter fold it up and I use a little more packing tape on the end, close it together. I burnish it a little bit. I was a little gappy on this one. So that closes that up. Then I use some band clamps, check it for square, and leave the slack for Jerry. A few hours later, I can remove the band clamps and remove all the tape. And. Ooh. All right. That works. Next up, I needed to rabbit the back of the case that we just made to accept the back of the case that we just made. I do this on the router table with a rabbiting bit and since I will be using a quarter inch material for this I rabbit it out a quarter of an inch deep by three-eighths of an inch wide. Whoo dusty! Next I head to the table saw to resaw the material for the back. Now unfortunately my baby little bandsaw only has about four inches of resaw capacity so I have to make several passes on the table saw to get this piece of three-quarter in half and then I can run it through the planer to exactly a quarter of an inch. And this is all relative dimensioning, people. I take it to the source, mark it, cut it, round off the corners to match what was left by the router bit, pop it in place, a couple dabs of glue, and I need to weigh it down, so router and a kettlebell. And while the glue dries, I go ahead and rip some 1 8 inch strips that will cover the plywood edge and the rounded corners of that back panel. I miter the corners, spread some glue, and fit the mitered frame. I use some 23 gauge pin nails to secure it while the glue sets up. I hide these in the dark areas of the grain and you can't even see them. Then I jog back over to the router table to cut the bevel for the front edge banding of the case. Now this time I do use the bearing on the chamfering bit since there is not a risk of that 1 8 inch fillet being damaged. Rip it on the table saw so I have a 3 quarter by 3 quarter inch piece of trim. Miter them on the miter saw. Do a little dry fit in place to make sure everything fits nicely. And then with the first two pieces in place, I mark the other end, cut that to length, and start gluing. Some glue and clampage. No nails on this bevel trim since it is the front show face of the piece. We just got to let the glue do its work and be patient. Got to keep it clean. 
Now once three sides are in place, I mark and cut the last long piece and double check it for fit before attaching. And while that's drying, we're off and running gluing up the blanks for our legs. And with those in the clamps, I set up my tapering jig to cut the leg templates on the table saw. Now these taper from two inches to an inch and a quarter. Ooh, nice. Now I made this little jig which allows me to double check all my angles and will serve as an assembly jig when I start gluing up the front and back legs. If you buy the plans to build your own end table, the plans for this jig also come with it. Now based on the SketchUp drawing, the top stretcher should meet the legs at 7 degrees. However, my taper must have been slightly off and it was just over 7. But this is where the jig pays for itself. Because if I had blindly cut all my parts, the tables would not have sat flat on the floor. Now the next day, I pull the leg blanks out of the clamps and mill them down flat and square. Now the top and bottom of the legs get cut to 5 degrees, so I lay them out on my blanks and mark the angles. These must be cut before they are tapered. If you do this, you can get two identical legs from one blank and only make one cut on the tapering jig. I do not have plans for this jig, but Rockler and Micro Jig sell one. And there you go. Two legs, almost as skinny as mine. Now I can take my other side stretcher templates and figure out the best grain selection. I rip them to width on the table saw, and then I cross cut them to length with my table saw sled. Why didn't you use the miter saw? Because I didn't. Now to match the splay angle of the legs, the side stretchers need to have a 5 degree bevel on the top and bottom. I use my bevel gauge and dial in the saw blade to a precise 5 degrees. And then rip that edge. And now I can cut the front and rear stretchers to their final length with that healthy 7 degree miter on the ends. With all my leg parts cut, I can double check the fit in my leg jig and mark everything accordingly. A1, A2, B1, B2. Now I can lay out for the dominoes and cut the mortises in the legs and the stretchers. As you can see, I jazzed up my leg assembly jig so I could easily machine the stretchers with some hold down clamps. But the revised jig plan that comes with the plan download is much more refined and less hodgepodge, my man. Next it was time to lay out the location for the bottom stretchers which start five and a half inches from the bottom of the leg. Then I can transfer my lines all the way around each leg paying close attention to the angle at which they need to be laid out. Then I mark for my dominoes and start plunging. Now since the side stretchers are cut to 90 on the ends, they didn't quite work in that jig, so I affixed a fixed fence with some double-sided tape to the domino and plunged all my mortises. At this point, I could drill all my screw holes for attaching the bottom shelf to the bottom stretchers. The outer two holes are enlarged to allow for wood movement. Glue up time! Now here is where the leg assembly jig is so choice. Once the glue and the dominoes are in and the parts start to come together, I can pop it in the jig and everything aligns where it should be. A little adjustment here and there. And I use some five degree clamping blocks to get me even clamping pressure across the joint. Then one by one, just pop each assembly into the jig, clamp it up, put it aside, oh, one more, and let those dry. Then I can move on to cutting the stock for the bottom shelf. Now the shelf is 11 inches wide, so you can get by with using two 1x6s. But of course I only had a 1x10, so I had to rip some off and then glue them up. And then after they were dry, I cut them to length on the table saw. Then I was back to the router table in that 45 degree chamfering bit to put a nice bevel on the end. I left a 3 16 of an inch fillet on the top on this one, just to give it a little more visual heft since it sits below the normal line of sight. With the glue dry, I could take the leg assemblies out of the clamps and give the joints a quick sanding. Now the bottom shelf stretcher meets the side stretchers at the same 5 degree angle at which the legs are splayed. I do a dry fit on that stretcher just to make sure everything lines up, mark my centers, and then I can start plunging for my dominoes. Now, a word of caution, I am using 30 millimeter dominoes, but if I don't adjust the plunge depth before hitting the side stretcher, it'll blow right through. So I cut a custom length domino and pop this little sub assembly together. Some dominoes, some glue. Yeah, you know the routine. Clamp it together. And now it's time to fully assemble both bases. I pre-glue in the dominoes just to make it a little easier. Full swig of coffee, deep breath, 
and we're off. If you'd like to purchase plans to build your own end table, check out the link in the description below. And maybe subscribe while you're at it. Ah, uh, mm, uh. Now I can turn my attention to the walnut drawer boxes. These are all milled to 5 eighths of an inch thick. And I cut them to length on the table saw. Now I'm going to use a simple rabbit joint on the ends which I make with my Infinity Datonator blade. This is an eight inch Datonator. Then I can set my table saw fence at a half inch and cut all the grooves in the sides of my drawers to accept the bottom. And now a little zen moment of chisel cleanup to flatten and square up the rabbit. The drawer bottoms are one quarter inch warped maple plywood courtesy of Home Depot. Now rather than glue up the entire drawer at once, I chose to clamp up three sides and let the glue set a little bit before inserting the bottom and attaching the back. That way I wasn't fighting four rabbited corners. Now, as you can see, I like to round the corners of the bottoms which allow them to slide into the groove a little bit easier. And yes, you saw a little glue in that groove. Now when dealing with plywood bottoms, I always glue them to avoid any rattle. While the drawers are in the clamps, I can turn my attention back to the base assemblies and pop all the clamps off. I like to clean the glue squeeze out post clampage uh, in most scenarios and my weapons of choice are a chisel and a card scraper and that little red woodpecker scraper you see which is great for getting in corners. Then I break all the sharp edges with some 150 grit sandpaper. And then I proceed to drilling out the recessed holes for the figure eight fasteners that will attach the top to the base. And here's a nifty little technique I picked up from Jason Bent over at Bent's Woodworking. I'm using a Forstner bit to create some semi-integrated, super low profile floor levelers. Now I use some epoxy to set the one quarter by 20 threaded inserts into each leg and then I screw in the padded feet. These let me adjust for any inconsistencies in my floors and they are virtually undetectable. Now it was time to start prepping the drawer boxes for the bloom undermount slides. I use my dado blade to cut the notches and then head to the drill press to cut the hole to accept the notch of the tab tilting mechanism thing. I'm just dry fitting all my parts at this point to make sure everything works. This is the push to open mechanism and then I can screw the slides into the side of the case. Now it's time to make the drawer fronts. I grab some more 3 quarter inch quarter sawn white oak and rip and cross cut them to fit. Before I apply the Rubio Mono Coat I use their raw wood cleaner to wipe down everything and remove any dust left behind after vacuuming. Then it was time to apply the Rubio. You can see I have the front beveled trim taped off. Unfortunately real wood doesn't always match the color of veneer plywood. In this case the veneer was much redder. So I applied my base color of the Smoke 5%, wiped off the excess, and then immediately hit it with the Savannah. The green tones of the Savannah neutralized the red and got the color much closer to the hardwood edging and the rest of the white oak on the table. With the top cases done, I could apply the Rubio to the rest of the white oak on the bases. My method is pretty simple. I work it in with a white Scotch-Brite pad and then wipe off all the excess with a finely laundered white t-shirt. The drawer boxes get hit with Rubio Pure, not the smoke. And I could attach all the figure eight fasteners. And pop the bases on their cases. I use a one by two block to ensure equal spacing and then clamp them down so nothing moves while I screw them together. Now the bottom shelves were a little tricky to wrangle into position. I cut 1 16th of an inch shims to make sure I had equal spacing between the front and back legs and that spacing also allows for seasonal wood movement. Now the friction fit of the shims kept the shelf in place while I checked the measurements on each end to make sure they're even and then I could screw through the stretchers into the shelf. And as I mentioned before those outer two screws are elongated to allow for seasonal wood movement. And with that, I could flip the tables back on their feet and start assembling everything. The drawers are first. I get the fronts attached to the carcasses. It's not a carcass, that's a drawer box. You can see my notches are a little bit bigger than they were before. I realized they needed to be that way to adjust for those tip-on mechanisms. And if you've never used bloom undermount slides, these funky little orange things are what attach the drawer to the slide and give you vertical and horizontal adjustments to fit the drawer perfectly in your opening. 
So now we'll push these in, give them a little oomph to engage that push to open mechanism. And look at that, it pushes to open. Then I can move over to the other one and do the same thing. That is the beauty of these push to open mechanisms. You don't need any hardware on the front, which is what I wanted to complete the clean look of these tables. Push, open. Now they do make a soft close mechanism for these, but I didn't realize that at the time, so I did not get them. And there you have it, two Sophia end tables. Twins! Got me a hankering now.